There is a new version of the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines available, or WCAG, as we call it for short. Version 2.2 was released on October 5th, 2023, and with it come nine new success criteria, of which six are required for AA level conformance. So let's take a look at what those six are and what they mean in practice. So first up, we have focus not obscured. What does that mean? That means that if an element has focus on it, so sometimes you might use the tab on your keyboard to focus and go between different links, or an assistive device might focus on a particular actionable item like a link, that element needs to be visible on the page. It cannot be hidden behind something. Now, there are exceptions to this. So for example, if an element that is, has focus or can have focus is hidden behind something that the user triggered, like for example, they clicked on a particular button and it created a pop-up, that's okay because that's something that the user can get rid of. But if let's say you have an element and it's focused, but it's behind a sticky footer or a sticky header or something the user cannot control, something that you built in into the right into the page, that is going to make that page fail this particular success criterion because that element is not visible. Now, let's take a look at a web page for a few more practical examples of this. Okay, so here we have a web page that a little bit of artificial intelligence helped me create. Thank you, V0 by Vercel. And then I tweaked it and brought it into CodePen. And it's an article with a lot of different links and a sticky social media footer at the bottom. Now, as I tab through the items, all of these links, you can see that each link has a visible focus border on it. So let me just tab through a bunch of them. Now at the very bottom, you can see there is a link it is partially obscured by that sticky footer. If I tab to it, nothing happens, but you can see part of that outline on that link. So for the success criterion focus not obscured, double A level conformance, this is gonna pass. But for triple A conformance is not gonna pass because for that, you have to have the entire element be visible. Now, look at what happens when I press tab one more time. The page shifted slightly, but now you don't see anything on the page that is focused. Why? Because there is a link that was behind the sticky footer. Whenever you focus on something, your browser will naturally shift the page in order to show you what that page, what that element is that you focused on, right? But when you have something like a sticky footer, that element is technically still on the page. It's just that you have something on top of it. So that's why the browser can't move to show you that because it doesn't really know the difference between a sticky something or a sticky not something from a focus perspective anyway. So that's not going to pass. Now here I have a button at the top and if I click it, a pop-up shows up. Now behind this, there are links that you could focus on. But because this is a pop-up that I triggered as a user and I can close like that, that's okay. It's fine that a focused possible focus element could be behind that pop-up, not an issue. But a sticky footer or a sticky header, something the user can cannot control, that's never going to pass if you don't make it at least a little bit visible. So how can you fix that? So in this particular situation for this footer, what you can do as a really easy solution is set up scroll padding bottom. So I'm gonna uncomment out this line of code that I have in my CSS. And now if we go through all of our links and try to navigate to the one that was hidden, you can see it actually moves the page so that you can see it. What we've done is we've taken the height of the sticky footer and added that as a padding for the scroll. So at least that much of the page is pushed up in order to make that focus visible uh, when you focus on an element. And typically in real practice, when you're using this in production, you're going to want to do this dynamically because you don't know what the size of your sticky element could be in case it's something that changes. But here, you know, for illustration purposes, I have it as something is fixed. Second, we have dragging movements. So 
you might have a map or some sort of situation where you need to drag something on the page. Now, typically when you need to do a dragging action, what you do is you take your mouse or your pointer, you click and hold and then move your pointer somewhere and then let go. Now that's an action that can be difficult if you might have some sort of disability or, you know, you don't have access to a pointer or a mouse, your trackpad died, anything could happen. So in order to pass this success criterion, you need to provide an alternative way and another way that someone can do the same thing, achieve the same action without having to drag something or keep a pointer held down while doing the movement. So there's a lot of ways that you can do this. You can provide a way so that someone can click on an item, let go, then press somewhere else, and then it detects and moves that object there. Or you can provide keyboard navigation or buttons that you know allow you to do sort of a movement on your page. So for example, if we take a look at Google Maps, you know, this is something that you usually drag, you know, you drag yourself around the map, looking at things, zooming at things, but you can also actually all just use your keyboard like that. So in this case, they've provided that as the alternative for dragging and that makes it accessible. So make sure that whatever situation you are in, if you have something that's draggable, you're finding and providing a way to drag something or achieve that same result without having to hold a pointer down. Number three, target size minimum. So any clickable input or element needs a minimum area of 24 pixels by 24 pixels that someone can click. If that element that you're talking about or focusing on is smaller than that, then what you need is enough space around it before someone can hit another element that is clickable. And there is a calculation for this that they provide, but essentially let's say this is your element, right? It's small. In this case, I think I set it to be 12 pixels by 12 pixels. I'm just in Figma here. Now, what you need is if you start from the center right here of this element and create a circle, so a circle like this, basically the circle should have a diameter or width, right, of 24 CSS pixels. And this whole area needs to be free of any other element that is clickable so that when someone is trying to click on this, they are able to. If someone's having a little trouble with the pointer or something, they're able to click on the element they want to click without accidentally clicking on a different element that they didn't want to click. It's a very common situation. You know, you wanted to press agree, but you accidentally press disagree. You wanted to press the yes radio button, but in instead you selected something else. It happens a lot. And this is meant to help solve that. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So here we have at the very bottom, two elements and they're very small. So in this case, I have a button that says A and then have another button that says A and their total minimum area is definitely not 24 pixels by 24 pixels. I think, actually we can test, let's see. So this element is 11.45 pixels by 29 pixels. So part of it kind of passes, but overall it fails. So. When you have a small element like that, what you wanna do is make sure that you have that enough space around it. And here, what I've done is I've created a gap between these two buttons because they're centered. So there's lots of infinite space around them on either end of them on the left and the right. But in the middle, I've given a gap of 12 pixels so that if someone were to create that circle, from the center of the, this element, there would be enough space to pass for that 24 pixels by 24 pixels spacing rule. And that can get a little more complicated. There's more formulas around it, but as a general rule of thumb, you know, make sure there's enough space around your clickable elements or make your clickable elements big enough that you don't have to create that extra space around them. Number four, consistent help. If you have some sort of assistance related link or icon or resource available on a page or on a website, make sure it's in the same place all the time. So what does that mean? If you have a chat icon that's here in the bottom right, then make sure it doesn't show up somewhere else in the top left. Always have that chat icon here at the bottom right, no matter what page they are on on the website. 
It's pretty common sense, but it's pretty important to maintain that consistency of where someone can go looking for help throughout your entire website or application. Number five, redundant entry. Don't make your user add information and provide it again and again in the same session. Once you've asked them for that information, store it in some way so that you don't have to ask them for it again. Now, there are exceptions to this. For example, for security reasons, you might have to ask a user for their password again when re-entering sensitive or secure areas on your website or app. But for the most part, if you've asked for information again, find a way so that you don't have to add that again. Something's really helpful if you have inputs, you know, turn auto populate on on those input elements so that, you know, users can use any kind of saved information in their browsers to populate that information. A really, really good example, though, is a checkout form. So let's take a look at one. OK, so here we're looking at the checkout form for the WordPress swag store. And, you know, we've got that standard contact information area, and then we have our shipping address area, and then we have our billing address area. Now for most people, their shipping address and their billing address is probably going to be the same. So this page, if it did not have a particular thing, would actually fail that success criterion because you're making the person add their address twice. But we have a wonderful little checkbox here called use same address for billing. And when you click that, that billing address area goes away. So by adding that checkbox, and in fact, on this form that is checked off by default, we are going to be able to pass the success criterion and not make the user redundantly add the same information once in, in a single session. And number six, accessible authentication minimum. Now, this is probably the most interesting one. And on the face of it, it might be actually a little bit alarming until you read the details. What accessible authentication means is that in order to authenticate into your website or application, what have you, the user should not have to perform a cognitive function test. So that means having to remember something or transcribe something or manipulate something. Now, if you thought about what that means, you're like, hang on remember something like 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 a password exactly they shouldn't be required to remember a password so as long as your username and password areas allow copy pasting or they allow a password manager to populate them you are fine and this also by the way applies to captchas or any kind of you know i am not a robot sort of situation so if you have one of those CAPTCHAs that lets you look at those squiggly weird letters and then you have to figure out like what those letters are and then type them in, if you have that as part of your authentication system, you're going to fail this success criterion. But, but the CAPTCHA where you have to do image identification like this one here that is traffic lights and you have to identify them and click on them, this one is going to pass because object recognition is considered is it's not considered a cognitive function test. So make sure that that your username and password areas are input friendly for password managers and for copy pasting and your authentication should be fine. And that's it, folks. Those are the six new success criteria from WCAG 2.2 that you have to pay attention to if you want to hit that double A level conformance and pass at that level at the very least. Now, as I mentioned in the beginning of the video, there were actually nine, nine new success criteria that were introduced as part of 2.2. In the video description, I'm going to pop some links where you can check out all of them. The reason I didn't include them is because they are triple A but you should definitely check them out because in a lot of situations, they're actually pretty easy to apply and make sure you pass on. And whenever you can make your page pass for any guideline at AAA, it's a pretty, pretty good feeling. Hope that helps. See you in the next video.